good afternoon, everybody. This is your host, Guillermo Sabatier. I am the, uh, and today we have uh, on our show, uh, Perspectives on Energy here on Think Tech Hawaii. And today we'll be talking about batteries and inverter-based resources for grid forming, right? Can we use grid storage to recover from a blackout? Uh, and again, I'm, I'm your host, Guillermo Sabatier. I am the Director of International Services for uh, HSI, the Health and Safety Institute, Industrial Skills. And uh, my background, of course, I mean, full disclosure, I've been in the electric utility industry for over 30 years. I worked for a rather large investor-owned, vertically integrated utility in, uh, in, in a southern state, Florida. So I definitely have had a lot of experience given uh, Black Start grid forming training, blackout restoration. So one of the new resources, right, that we're looking at quite in detail now is the use of batteries. Um, Definitely a lot of changes here, and a few utilities have looked to explore that, but there's still a lot to learn and a lot to experiment. So we'll talk some more about that. Today's presentation really is brought to you. I, I'm just uh, is brought to you by the uh, U.S. Department of Energy, the DOE, and they, in partnership with the National Renewable Energy Laboratories. So the DOE has uh, furnished the uh, one of the reports that they had, which of course is available down in the link at every one of the slides. But uh, if you want to go and take a deeper look, it's certainly really, really interesting reading. So I'm just going to give you the highlights of the particular presentation or their report and try and walk you all through it. Okay, uh, next slide, please. All right. So uh, what is Black Star, right? And and usually the uh, before we get into the Black Star, let's just talk about uh, the majority of the of the system, the grid, the bulk electric system, right? The, and everything connected to the transmission grid is currently has a lot of synchronous generators. And for the most part, uh, for the last many decades, it has been synchronous generators. What does synchronous generator mean? Well, it's generator with a lot of spinning mass, inertia, metal, magnets, iron, copper, spinning in there. And of course, it's spinning at 60 hertz, meaning, meaning 60 cycles per second. And that's the frequency here in the US. Other parts of the world, Japan, you know, half of it, parts of Europe, they run at 50 hertz, 50 cycles a second. But what does that mean, right? If you have like a simple two-pole system, it's going to, going to be spinning at 3,600 RPM, right? Uh, now, uh, when you look at um, what's been traditionally the, the components that make up the grid, usually they have been just synchronous generators, which means they're all running at the same at the same speed at the same phase angle, right? Meaning that they're all a, uh, a phase over here is a phase over there, running at the same frequency and and at, at the same phase angle. So that's what they mean by synchronized, right? And whenever a generator wants to come online, uh, they usually have to like synchronize it, which means you have a lot of synchronizing uh, relaying and protection equipment and, 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 and breakers and, and switches that will go ahead and do a sync check before they, they close the breaker on that device to make sure that it's closed right at that point where it matches the rest of the grid, right? Meaning not just frequency, because you can have something spinning at the same speed, but it's way off, way off not matching, or but you also want to have, for example, that they're matching together with the same phase angle and the same frequency, pretty close to each other, right? It doesn't have to be exact, but they're usually within a plus or minus certain percentage. All right, so now that we establish what synchronous, synchronous generation means, uh, if, uh, right now, for example, the present power system, there's uh, some of them have a lot of, a lot of the black star uh, resources out there, you know, for, for the most part is um, what happens when all that goes dark, you know, all of a sudden becomes the energy, so you have a huge blackout and nothing is running. Well, you have to start from scratch, right? And I'm sure most of us are familiar with a simple generator that we have in the backyard, in the garage, you pull it out, uh, turn that thing on, it's a 4K KW generator to run a few air conditioners and your, your refrigerator, some lights. Well, that thing, for example, is small. It has only one generation and one load, and you're not going to connect that to the grid because it's isolated. The difference here is that most of these generators that we use for grid forming eventually have to tie to the de-energized grid, but it's an isolated portions of the de-energized grid. Right? So when you have a larger generator, usually a hydroelectric is one of the uh, larger types of uh, blackout restoration resources out there. Uh, they can start almost immediately. 
they always have they always have fuel available, which is water, right? Well, water pressure spins that spins that turbine, and then that turns the generator, so they can start it and stop it rather easily. Uh, and that's and those have a lot of rotation or inertia, and we'll talk about what that means as well in a minute. Uh, the, but then you also have a lot of smaller units. The, one, the ones I am more familiar with in my experience have been those smaller combustion turbines or smaller diesel generators. That those, you know, those can be synchronized to the grid when the grid is nice and healthy and running, but they have that capability to be able to like restart and then energize the dead bus and energize the station, help to bring other systems online, pick up a little bit of load and balance that as they bring in to... Uh, form the grid in that regard right so in a lot of cases right yeah these are usually smaller smaller generators uh there are some bigger ones out there that between 100 and 200 megawatts are a little a little bigger but for the most part they tend to be small because you're starting small and some of those are going to be as small as a diesel powered reciprocating engine diesel generator that has about maybe 12 megawatts or sometimes even smaller than that other cases, you have other combustion turbines that burn natural gas, which we have quite a bit of those. Those tend to be like similar to like a jet engine, right? And then you have others that also also run on liquid fuel, meaning there's no pipeline. It's just the liquid fuel is stored on site, and that is what's burned for that regard, right? So you have different options when it comes to uh, presently, when it comes to grid forming. Uh, not a lot of storage when it comes to batteries. Now, when I say hydroelectric, keep in mind that you also have the capability of maybe using what they call pump storage plants. And in one of the previous episodes, I did talk about pump storage having that capability, right? Which is, and in this case, no different than hydroelectric, except here you have a finite amount of time and output from from that hydro uh, from that reservoir of water resource, right? Eventually, you will run out of that water because it's waiting for the end of the day to go ahead and pump that water back up to the reservoir. So that would be a pump storage plant. And those can also serve as a grid forming or what they call a black star uh, generation. Next slide, please. So uh, now we're changing, right? So what's going on with the, the future of the grid and right now currently how the grid is changing. So right now we have, you know, what we ideally would like is to have a more diverse mix. We may have something that's powered by coal, you know, which is still out there. They haven't retired them all yet and it's gonna be a while before they do. Uh, you know, gotta be honest. There's pressure to do that, but you know, you can't replace base load with just solar panels. Um, and then, then, of course, but we're also seeing a great amount of renewables on the grid, right? Even, and that's one of the one of the one of the, one of the pressures that we're seeing in, in the system, right? Uh, the more solar we get, the more wind we get, the more the more problems that can cause in the sense of variability, which then in turn affects reliability. Now, as you get rid of that base load generation, which is stuff that's always there, always on, and dispatchable with something that's that's variable. And you have no control over that dispatch, then you run into some, some problems when it comes to reliability due to that variable output. Now, uh, one thing to remember, right? Base load generation is not useful for grid forming. Uh, and, and that is an important point because these larger generators that are normally base loaded units, I mean, I'm talking about big coal units, big combined cycle plants, those take a long time to start. And when I say long time, it can be anywhere between several hours to maybe uh, a a couple of days right to, to get to get them going so uh in some cases right like, like some of these fast start combustion turbines you can maybe get them on in about maybe 15 20 minutes that's great but then they seem to be a lot bigger right? so so um the only large generator that's really useful for like black start that's that, that that you know that's big is usually hydroelectric right but the rest of them usually black start tend to be smaller units that can be started quickly because they don't have a lot of inertia to get spinning right because again, the, the, when I say more inertia, it means one unit that's big, it's spinning. And when I say spinning, meaning it, it's got a lot of mechanical torque and then pushing electrons out. And uh, as you get more of those on a system, the more of those you have synchronized running together, the more inertia you have. When, why is that a benefit? Well, you're able to pick up more load uh, without having to feel a, a sudden hit. Imagine uh, many, many cars or actually many locomotives pulling tight together, pulling a load up a hill. Well, if you have one locomotive running at like 80%, uh, the, the moment you have some change on that load or change in slope, then that locomotive is going to struggle. Whereas you have five locomotives or six, six locomotives all running at 10, 12%, they have a lot more capability and then a lot more torque behind it. 
because they have a greater operating rate. So they, so it it's it's uh, a, a lot more than sharing the work is a lot better than than a few of them trying to share a lot of the work and almost at the capability limits. So that's why that's the analogy I can think of when it comes to inertia. Right, they're they're able to do it with a lot less effort because they're doing it together. And so when you start to get get rid of that inertia and you use other resources. Now you're getting into the trouble, the problem of that, them not being that responsive to a fault, and uh, meaning that if you have a, a, certain, a certain change in demand in the system, they're unable to, to recover as quickly. Which comes, which will take us to the next topic when it comes to inverter-based resources, right? So uh, these batteries, for example, what you're seeing now, there's a lot of them out there in the system. Not as not as much capacity as the solar or the wind. But a lot of them are being installed along with these these renewable resources. So so what happens here, right? So as long as you have enough storage or charge in this battery at any given time, it's a it's a reliable renewable it's a reliable resource for for Black Star. But this battery, of course, if it's under fifty percent, it will not be as useful as a battery that's almost eighty percent charged, right? So that makes sense. Starting from scratch, you have to pick up some load, and there's no way to recharge it until everything is in. You get somebody something else running. That's just producing megawatts that's not reliant on stored energy. Right? There's another example why wind at this time is not a good grid forming application. Maybe if you got batteries to start the grid again, and then you begin to accept power from a wind farm at a certain level, you might be able to charge that battery a little bit. But then you have the challenge of variability, right? Where you can't really quite control the amount of power coming out of that wind farm. And part of it going back into the battery, and you don't have enough load to balance all of that. So again, not a great application. Here's where you would need actual load that you can control, and generationally you control the output very carefully. Right? So along with these, um, all these batteries, for example, whether it's solar, wind, or a battery, they all have inverter-based uh, resource, which means that all these devices are producing a DC output uh, from the actual source going through the inverter, which then becomes a clean, nice AC signal that is being put out at a frequency 60 hertz. And then you have to like synchronize that to the rest of the grid. In this case, most of them are not designed to connect to a to a dead bus. So really a synchronized, uh, really specialized IBR controllers, right? And which can pick up a dead bus and can also uh, start picking up load, right, from, from, from that particular device. So quite a bit of a challenge in this case when it comes to that. And a lot of the manufacturers aren't quite there yet, or they say they can, but then they then the generator that's tied to it won't warrant it. So quite quite a few hurdles to actually get across when it comes to this particular application. Go ahead and uh, next slide, please. Okay, so here we have the present versus the future grid configuration, and it kind of talks about what we talked about in the in the previous uh, slide about how things look like right now. So you have you have the present, you see all the generators up there, you have your know, cooling towers, you have a smokestack, you have houses, you have factories, you have a few wind farms, a few solar sites, and then off to the left you see that we see, you know you see a generator, a few inverters, not that many of course, and limited application at this time, right? Not a lot of solar. In the future, you're going to be seeing a whole lot more inverter-based resources. Some are smaller than others, some are bigger than others. A lot more wind, a lot more solar, a lot fewer generators. And that's where the concern comes to me, right? Where I'm seeing a lot less base load and a lot more reliance on these renewable resources that are variable and a lot of a, a greater reliance on these inverter-based resources which in itself sounds great, but it has a couple of challenges. So as you can see, uh, you've done away with a lot of generation, you've added more load, and you you really have a lot less of those generators in place and uh, a lot less of that base load in place as well on the diagram on the right. So next slide, please. So in this case, right, uh, you're looking at, for example, what happens in, in these uh, power stability concepts. And when you look at the present classical framework, the current system, you have a lot of generators with a few inverters. It's just, just what you gotta think of in mind. Whereas on the future system, you have a lot of inverters with very few machines that are spinning, meaning that you're not gonna have a lot of inertia in the system. And that's really where the problem comes in. And in this case, right, the ability to handle changes in frequency and voltage are going to be a little bit challenging, especially when it comes to rotor angle stability. Uh, cycles and seconds. Now, uh, 
we're looking to see where the research research will go in these regards. But uh, one of the things we're definitely worried about is the ability to be able to withstand or ride through a fault or or be able to ride through a, an, an excursion. And we'll talk about this some more in the next few slides. Okay, next slide, please. And this is basically one of the controllers where we talked about inverter-based resources, whether it's grid following or grid forming. Right now, most of them are just grid following. So they are... The assumption is that the grid's always on, always energized, and you're going to tie in and synchronize to a, a healthy grid, right? And the interesting thing here is that uh, it needs to have a voltage reading, right, to be able to so, so, so you calculate deliver power, deliver real and reactive power as P and Q. And the interesting thing here is that um, you always have a problem with instability, right? You cannot operate 100% power electronics penetration, meaning that it's, it's going to have a problem uh, respond when you have a lot of like uh, of these I, I, IBRs out there in the system. If you have a fault, a lot of them will tend to just want to like trip off and not operate and not and because they're, they're trying to protect themselves in this regard. So they can't handle these write throughs. So, and that's a great following control system because they can actually have the, they have the luxury at this time to be able to kind of like back off and, and, and take no part in a grid disturbance event because they're relying on. On, on the assumption that there's a lot of like grid stability out there brought to you by inertia, which at this time we're losing more and more of and being replaced by these like uh, IBRs. So that you see it here is a problem, right? They're, they're assuming you have plenty of, uh, in, uh, plenty of stability out there thanks to these, the inertia, system inertia. But the problem is as more of these IBRs you get online, you're going to have fewer and fewer um, spinning machines, which means you lose that inertia stability. So the next option is grid forming control, right? And grid forming control here uh, on the right, uh, the, the right set of uh, on the columns, of those rows on the right, right? Here, it's the main difference that it can black start a power system, right? And uh, and theoretically, it can operate 100% power electronics penetration. So it can coexist with grid following, right? So you can have some of these like uh, inverter-based resources leading, whereas some of the other ones are just following it, following the the lead. It's just a matter of, of, of settings, software, and having the correct equipment set up, right? And again, this is not really standardized. This is more of a specialized application. And with anything specialized, you know what happens, right? It's going to be more expensive. And not to mention the fact that anything that is classified as grid forming in the system will also have a, a, a certain unique compliance requirement. That's NERC uh, EOP005. And that one has a certain extensive amount of uh, that NERC standard has, I think, over 18 requirements. A lot of those are on Black Start, and they have a lot of testing and a lot of training requirements that, that are involved that are definitely a, a concern. And on top of all that, there's also a certain burden of compliance when it comes to SIP standards, right? Critical infrastructure protection, whether it's physical security or it is cybersecurity. So again, that becomes very burdensome in that regard when you look at a Black Star power system. Uh, the, this, the Black Star capability for one of these IBRs would make it almost cost ineffective to actually uh, Put that in service and operate it commercially as a as an inverter based resource. That's another concern that you have, right? It's cost. So uh, operating grid following it becomes very very uh, profitable. But when you do grid forming, now you have a whole new set of standards you must abide by. Then that, that changes the uh, the economics calculus of whether you want to be in this business or not. So that's an interesting change. All right, next slide, please. And here again is a is, is an illustration brought to you by from NERC back from 2017, and here they're talking about what's happening with system inertia and the eastern interconnection. We're not even talking about WEC. We're not talking about ERCOT. We're just talking about the eastern interconnection, and it shows you a, the long term trend, right? Going and right now we're we're way past that final year of 2020, so we've lost more of that than that we can imagine. And uh, that this actually this uh, the long term versus the short term it's actually a lot worse than we see on this graph. So we've lost quite a bit of inertia because of all the early retirements of all of these like uh, coal-fired or older gas-fired plants that are, for the sake of climate change, then we're replacing that with some of these like battery or wind. 
So and that and that becomes an issue because you can see here you, you know losing the data inertia on there is going to be a concern when it comes to be able to being able to write through certain disturbances, which takes us to our next slide. <laughs> So uh, there's a NERC standard, PRC0024, and there's a new version out now. This is actually a little old, dash three is a newer version. And what, it, what they did here is they actually did a really nice separation so you could tell the difference. But uh, when you look at the voltage right through, uh, looking at, for example, the horizontal is time, the vertical axis is a, a per unit figure, meaning uh, one per unit is right down the middle of both curves, is like 100%. 1.1 is like 10% above, uh, 0.9 is like 10% you know, below. So ideally they want you to stay uh, for, and really it's a short period of time. I'm talking about like tenths of a second, a second and a few seconds where you have an excursion in voltage. So if you have enough of a voltage excursion, these uh, inverters need to be able to ride through some of these areas. And you see it says no trip zone over there to the right. Um, on, the, on the graph on the, on, on the right, I'm sorry, uh, here it talks about, for example, over voltage right to the uh, envelope, which means uh, you're looking, you're measuring, for example, uh, those transient high voltages that you, that you encounter sometimes. And these are in the millisecond range, right? So that's the expectation at, at that time for these inverter based resources to be able to survive, for example, those transient voltages. For a machine that's spinning around plenty of inertia, it wouldn't even be an issue, right? But they have to create these standards and these like parameters for these inverter based resources in order to prevent some of the issues that have already been experienced where we lost 1,000, 2,000 megawatts in one shot. Uh, and that, that happened in California and, and a couple in Texas that were rather severe, right? And that, that almost brought about an, uh, a blackout, but they had to shed a lot of customer load. So that's an example. Let's go to the next slide. <laughs> so here you're looking at, for example, the one I care about a lot is the Eastern, which is like in purple magenta. You see how you have, for example, time in seconds, that is a logarithmic uh, uh, scale, and you're looking at frequency. So you can see how the amount of time, there, there, there's, there's a narrow band when you don't trip, and it's rather, you know, it's rather generous at first, you know, and but then once you get like like uh, those excursions, you can't be on that on those edges for far too long over time. It gets a little tighter, especially in the Eastern Internet Connection. I see Quebec and ERCOT, well, Quebec is very generous, right? But then the ERCOT has is, is is generous, and then it's not up until the uh, the thousand second mark. So definitely, uh, uh, with with the newer version of the standard, what they did was they separated all these graphs so you can have a better view of how that looks like. But the point is that uh, you look at seconds, milliseconds, several seconds, right, of uh, frequency excursion. Uh, it's pretty forgiving, but the reality is that when you have a lot of these in the system and you begin to lose, you have a significant frequency excursion, most generators, regular spinning machines will trip uh, when they go below 58 hertz, right? And so that tells you where you could be in, the, in that particular regard where these, these devices are being asked to stay on and right through uh, at a wider wider type of like excursion for a lot longer period of time. Manufacturers have already set it up and they've agreed, but as you can see, it becomes a challenge. So next slide, please. So how do we get to this, right? Uh, how do we get to the point where we have matured the technology enough to the point where we are uh, we are looking at, you know, what are the key steps in getting there? And it's going to be a long time to get. So the first one here on the right is grid forming inverters. So now we're asking, okay, what do we need to find out? So we don't even know what we don't know right now. We're trying to de develop where what direction we want to head when it comes to R&D. That's research and development. The next phase of that will be on the right is grid forming validation and demonstration. So here, you know, we move beyond theory and simulation, and we actually have uh, actual actual resources that we we're going to build and test. And and then once you create a rather standardized and 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 uh, format that we agree with, we standardize that, and then we begin to manufacture and develop tools for the practitioners to be able to study it better. And at that point, you move on towards wide grid forming adoption, which means now you've agreed on a, on, on a benchmark or a standard, and you begin to apply that in the industry. Having the same problem with SMRs, right? Small modular reactors. We, we all can't agree on a design that we can go ahead and implement, right? Uh, and uh, solve this problem of a supply chain. So uh, again, looking at what we're looking at when it comes to uh, wind and next slide, please. 
we're looking at the wind and solar and, and synchronous AC system as percentage of capacity in megawatt hours. And you're looking at, uh, this is brought to you by National Renewable Energy Labs, right? And we have uh, right now a system size. Uh, the bigger the system, somehow the smaller the, the percentage of capacity uh, in that system. But you notice the smaller systems, when you look at Hawaii, uh, uh, there's one in Australia, one in Maui, uh, one in the Canary Islands. Those tend to be, uh, they have they have wind and solar are rather a big component of their system is comprised of, of uh, renewable resources, right? Which is in, in itself a, a big concern because uh, as much as they have, for example, capacity that's, that's base load, they have almost as much of it is also as, as renewable resources, which is, becomes highly, un, highly variable and puts them at risk right in this case. All right, next slide, please. So in this case, again, how many years will this take? And it's going to talk about where we're at in each of the trends, uh, one or three years, right? Yeah. And so, so right now we're at present. We're trying to figure out what, what we don't know and what we want to find out. Uh, one or three years from now, we're trying to figure out how to like uh, resolve those issues. Three or six years, we're going to go ahead and start. Really, we're going to begin to form them first on microgrids, which is really where these islands like Hawaii, for example, become a really good test bed for this. And they're the first ones to benefit from these particular grid forming IBRs, right? And then beyond six years, right, is that, is that when you begin to see it in the uh, large scale and bigger bulk grids and also in the in, in the mainland across the nations? Next slide, and the final slide. So uh, again, same thing, but looking from a, from, a, from a bottom to top approach, right, where we're at and eventually where we'll be. And some of them say between 10 to 30 years is where we're finally gonna get there with grid forming uh, across the grid. I think you'll see it. You see it sent everywhere else uh, in, in spotty deployments. I think by then we'll see a lot more nuclear in place. That's able to start and and and, and shut off and be dispatched a little bit easier. So again, we're going to be uh, what, the places you might see this deployed first is going to be in the islands like Hawaii, Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands, Samoa. Uh, the Canary Islands, where you see some of them already in place, and then eventually, as they get get refined, you'll see them go into larger island grids, and then eventually, uh, after three plus years, you'll see them go into like larger mainland systems. So that is all we have for today. Um, hopefully, we kind of like talked a little bit, scratched the surface of some of these inverter-based resources and how they are likely to be used for um, grid forming or blackout restoration or black start. Um, Clearly, we have uh, quite a long ways to go, but hopefully, you know, this uh, touches on a few topics that we still have left to discover. So, anyway, thank you again for uh, signing in, take a look, and uh, please feel free to leave any comments or send, uh, send messages. I'll try my best to respond to them. And again, thank you for joining us here on Perspectives on Energy, brought to you by Think Tech Hawaii and the uh, Health and Safety Institute. Thank you again, and have a wonderful afternoon. Bye-bye now.